only two NFL teams are playing in their original stadiums. Only two stadiums are named after a person. And one team's home stadium has gone through 10 different names. It's time for NFL Explained, History of NFL Stadiums. The 2020 season saw the NFL welcome two of the most expensive, high-tech stadiums the league has ever seen. It's like Tomorrowland when you show up at Disney. But for every stadium that's gone up, there are countless that have come down. The venues teams call home have been hit by planes, as well as massive snowstorms. They are stories you simply can't make up. And if you want, you can jump to your team's story, where you'll see all the different stadiums your team has called home throughout its history. But the story of NFL stadiums officially began at a park in the Midwest back in 1920 in Dayton, Ohio, at Dayton's Triangle Park. This is the site of the very first game between two NFL teams, the league at the time known as the APFA. The Dayton Triangles on October 3rd, 1920, hosted the Columbus Panhandles at Triangle Park. There was no fencing around the stadium, so uh, it was hard to control whether paying customers were coming to the field or not. Now the Triangles and Panhandles didn't last, but two others from the league's rookie season did. The Chicago Bears, known originally as the Decatur Staley's, played that 1920 season at Staley Field. The A.E. Staley Starch Manufacturing Company sponsored the team and had a field on its campus. So that makes it the first NFL stadium or field ever to be named after a sponsor company. But a year later, player owner George Hallis moved them to the big city and into one of the most iconic stadiums in all of sports, Wrigley Field. Mr. Staley gave Coach Hallis $5,000 and said, take them, they're yours. Take them to Chicago, which is a big enough market to support them. Best stories about their days there, how they had to add padding to the brick walls. Guys like Bronco Nagurski actually running into them on occasion. Then that crack is still there. Ultimately, though, Wrigley wasn't big enough by NFL standards, so the Bears would move into a new den, Soldier Field. It has all the splendor and spectacle of ancient Rome. Soldier Field on Chicago's lakefront, the combat arena for the modern gladiators of the Chicago Bears. Soldier Field was known as Municipal Grant Park Stadium when it was opened in 1924. It was renamed Soldier Field in 1925 to honor servicemen and women from World War I. It's undergone several makeovers since the Bears moved in. The biggest forced Chicago to play their home games elsewhere for one season. University of Illinois Memorial Stadium, their temporary landing spot, which they borrowed in 2002, before returning to their old digs in 2003. In their newly renovated stadium, Chicago had quite the home field advantage. The Bears finished 6-2 and two at Soldier Field and captured their first win against the AFC champion Oakland Raiders. New Soldier Field, as some call it, was built within the shell of the old one. They did preserve the colonnades and the 250-foot granite wall memorial sculpture. Aside from that, though, most everything else is pretty much new, including the statues out front of Sweetness, a.k.a. Walter Payton, and Papa Bear, George Hallis. The stadium holds 61,000 fans, the smallest of any stadium in the league. But you'll still hear plenty of bear down cries at games, the team's motto, and its fight song. If you consider the new Soldier Field to be nothing more than a remodeled version of the old one, then you're looking at the oldest stadium in the NFL. The only other team to stick around since 1920, the Cardinals. For their first two seasons in the league, their home games were at Normal Park in Chicago. After that, it was off to Comiskey Park, where they would eventually win their first NFL championship. That's right, a lot of fans don't realize the Cardinals are two-time champs, winning both of their titles while playing at Comiskey their first in 1925, and then once more in 1947. The Chicago Cardinals, winners of the Western Division, meet the Philadelphia Eagles, Eastern title holders. And here's Charlie Trippi on a 75-yard run for a touchdown. Watch him go, and what a run, the longest of the game. OK, buckle up, because these birds did some serious flying around back in their day. After the 1925 season, they were back at Normal Park until 1928 then back to Comiskey for the 1929 and 1930 seasons. 
From there, it was Wrigley Field from 1931 to 1939 followed by their third and final stint at Comiskey, a stint that lasted 20 seasons. Though in between, they actually played a few home games in Pittsburgh of all places, World War II forcing a merger between the two teams in 1944. They lost every game that season. So while they were referred to as the Pitt Card franchise, most people in that era inverted the name and called them the Carpets because they got walked on all season long. Fast forward to 1959 though, the Cardinals were again looking for a new home, the league hoping to move them to a new state as they had become Chicago's other team. For the 1959 season, they split time between two spots, Soldier Field, where they played four games, and because the NFL had interest in putting a team in Minnesota, they played two games at Metropolitan Stadium, but at the end of the season, it was time for a major change of scenery. They were off to St. Louis, their new nest, Bush Stadium. The St. Louis Cardinals in dark shirts score first against the Giants as King Hill, number 12, hits number 44, John Crow, in the end zone. Bush Stadium, also known as Sportsman's Park, the Grid Birds, as they were known, played there from 1960 to 1965. Along came 1966, and Bush Stadium was demolished. Bush Memorial Stadium, though, was ready for occupancy. Rising in gleaming splendor on the banks of the Mississippi, part of the new St. Louis, is the magnificent Civic Center Stadium, home of the football Cardinals for 1966. The Cardinals persuaded the city to build Bush Memorial in part by threatening to fly off to Atlanta. Big Red ended up playing there until 1988. That's when they headed out west to the desert, first going by the Phoenix Cardinals and playing in Sun Devil Stadium from 1988 to 2005. In week two for the first official NFL game of the Valley of the Sun, a sellout crowd welcomed the Cardinals and Monday Night Football to Sun Devil Stadium. The Cardinals spent 18 years at ASU Stadium, the longest any NFL team has ever played at a college venue. Finally, in 2006, it was time to move into State Farm Stadium, AKA the Big Toaster. The Arizona Cardinals set a franchise record for single season attendance. Our fans responded by selling out the stadium. Most of the games are sold out in about six minutes. The exterior designed to resemble a barrel cactus. Just look really hard. But what really makes the stadium unique was what you'll find on the inside. They built the first fully retractable field in North America. The grass playing field can be rolled outside to get sunlight and then rolled back in for games. They also have a memorial to Pat Tillman. That's a must see. Now, most of Arizona's past homes have been demolished. Normal Park is long gone. Bush Stadium was taken down in 1966, the site now home to a boys and girls club. Comiskey Park was demolished in 1991 and is now a parking lot, common transformation for a lot of old stadiums. And Bush Memorial was raised in 2005. They were going to implode it originally, but they had to use a good old fashioned wrecking ball instead for fear of damaging a nearby subway system. In small towns throughout America, pro teams sprang up, prospered briefly, and died. But in one, the team survived. In Green Bay, Wisconsin. The Packers joined the league in 1921, kicking things off at Hagermeister Park, which they played at for their first two years in the league. The park was owned by Hagermeister Brewery, who weren't overly worried whether every fan paid to see them play. They would uh, dub a journalist or or somebody that had some affiliation with the team to walk around and pass the hat to collect uh, money from the fans uh, to, to pay the players. But the stadium was torn down for a high school, so the pack was on the move. Next stop, Bellevue Park. Bellevue Park was a small minor league baseball stadium, but they actually used the same lumber from Hagermeister to build it. After just two seasons there, the Packers were ready to move again, this time into City Stadium to begin the 1925 season. City Stadium is historic because it was the first stadium ever built specifically for the purposes of watching professional football. It was specifically built to house the Green Bay Packers. Uh, they would actually, uh, there was a high school nearby dress in the high school. The Packers played there for 28 years, but in between they played a few games around the state to try and attract more fans. They played one game at Borchard Field in 1933. And between 1934 and 1951, they played a number of games at Wisconsin State Fair Park. 
their road show in 1952 saw them play a game at Marquette Stadium. And from 1953 to 1994, they made regular trips to play in Milwaukee County Stadium. All those, however, just appetizers for New City Stadium, which we all know today as Lambeau Field. Football is a way of life in Green Bay. There is never an empty seat in Lambeau Stadium. The only way anyone gets to see a game is by buying a season ticket. Goodness, I haven't missed a game in 15 years. The stadium wasn't named Lambeau until 1965, following the death of the team's original owner, Curly Lambeau. Lambeau Field is the longest continuously occupied stadium in the NFL by 15 years. And in all of sports, only the Red Sox and Cubs have played in their homes longer than the Packers. The Title Town USA nickname started in the 60s. No shock, they won a lot of titles in that decade. The thermometer stands at 19 degrees, but championship fever has things heated up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The field itself, meantime, is often referred to as the frozen tundra, the moniker first being used by Steve Sable in an NFL Films video. Thanks to a marvelous job by the groundsmen, the field will be hard, but not completely frozen. There are the cheese heads, of course. The guy that invented the foam, Ralph Bruno. He made the first one using foam from his mom's couch. You've got the Lambeau Leap, of course, a tradition Leroy Butler is credited for starting in 1993. Knocked down to the 38-yard line. And a fumble! Tackle. Do the Packers have the ball? Apparently they do. And they're going to give it to Leroy the Butler goes to the touchdown. It is a touchdown for Leroy Butler. Oh, what a play for the Pack. And then there's the Packers fight song. Whoa! or Go You Packers Go, as it was originally titled. It was first played at a Packers game in 1931 by the Lumberjacks and is the first fight song ever written for a professional football team. The next NFL club to come along that would stick, the New York Giants, who joined the league in 1925 using an iconic stadium in its own right, the Polo Grounds. The polo grounds the Giants used for 30 seasons was the third incarnation of the stadium. The original was opened in 1876 and built in an area of Central Park known for holding polo matches, thus the name. Probably the most famous game the Giants ever played there, the 1934 title game, which has earned the nickname the Sneaker Game. The field at the polo grounds was frozen, the Giants were losing at halftime. Ray Flaherty was our assistant coach. He said that one year at Gonzaga, we won a game by using basketball shoes on the field, on a frozen field just like this. He volunteered to go up to Manhattan College and get the basketball shoes for the basketball team. The Bears spent the rest of the afternoon fruitlessly chasing the sneaker-clad Giants. As the 50s rolled around, the NFL was gaining popularity. The Giants needed more room, so they upgraded from one famous baseball stadium to another, moving into Yankee Stadium. The Giants played at Yankee Stadium up until 1973. In the 17 years they played in the fame ballpark, the Giants fielded some great teams and some great players. They gave their fans six championships and many lasting memories. They also gave their fans what's been called the greatest NFL game ever played, even if the home team took the loss in that game. Alan Amici dives through a huge hole and the game is over. The Baltimore Colts win a historic overtime victory. It was the first sudden death overtime postseason game in NFL history and really captured the hearts and the attention of the American public. The Giants had a new pad in the works when the 70s came knocking, but it wasn't ready on time. So they spent two seasons at the Yale Bowl in Connecticut. The Yale Bowl, 1974, the Jets beat the Giants in a game in overtime. With one flick of his wrist, Joe Namath won the championship of New York. The Jets, not the Giants, were the victors in the first sudden death overtime to be decided under the league's new rules. Before that, regular season games that ended in ties stayed that way. From there, it was off to Shea Stadium for the 1975 season, which was a busy place that year. They shared Shea with the Mets, Yankees, and Jets. Three might be company, but four is a crowd. So in 1976, they moved out to East Rutherford, New Jersey. Welcome to Giant Stadium. The escalator immediately in front of you will take you to the upper level. Please watch your step and enjoy the game. The soaring concrete and steel structure, only six and a half miles from the heart of mid-Manhattan, is considered by the Giants to be the finest football facility in the world. The Swamp, home of Bill Parcells, Lawrence Taylor, and Jimmy Hoffa. That's the legend, anyway, that the legendary union boss was buried there. 
They played at Giant Stadium until 2009, and then it was finally time to make the move to MetLife. They got it all. They got the shrimp. They got seafood salad, crab legs. They got lobster. The one thing the New York Giants need to do today is establish this new place as Giants' new home. Capacity of 82,500. That makes it the largest stadium in the NFL. Because it's the Jets' home as well, pretty much everything is customizable, including the end zone turf, which is removable, first of its kind. As for their old stomping grounds, four of the six stadiums they have played at have been demolished. The Polo Grounds biting the dust in 1964, Shea Stadium being taken down in 2009, Yankee Stadium was taken down the following year, and so was Giants Stadium, demolition work being completed just before the Giants would make their debut at their new home. The city is Detroit, but they come from all of Michigan. The Detroit Lions has reflected the character of the area, giving its supporters nothing less than total dedication to achievement. The Detroit Lions, they first started playing in the NFL in 1930 as the Spartans, and they started out playing in Universal Stadium in Portsmouth, Ohio. Universal was renamed Spartan Municipal Stadium in 1970, and it's still standing today as it was designated a state historical site in 2003. But the Spartans were eventually bought out by George Richards for 8,000 bucks. He moved them to Detroit in 1934 renamed them the Lions, and first set them up to play at University of Detroit Stadium. Their stay at Detroit Stadium only lasted four years, but it was there the Lions played their very first Thanksgiving Day game. But come 1938, the Lions were moving on up to Briggs Stadium, which eventually became known as Tiger Stadium. The Lions spent over 35 years at Tiger Stadium, their very last game played there on Thanksgiving. Tiger Stadium was the mecca of Detroit sports. It was a blue collar stadium, built a long time ago. Lions games back in Tiger Stadium were great because the stadium really wasn't configured for football that much, so it had its own character. The city of Pontiac had been making a pitch to build Detroit a new stadium in the early 70s, and by 1975, it was ready for business. The massive sports facility would offer a futuristic new backdrop for a young Lions squad whose goal in 1975 would be one of establishing a foundation for tomorrow. The Silver Dome. It featured a fiberglass fabric roof that was held up by air pressure, the first time that technology was used in a major athletic facility. But with the new century, the Lions were ready for a new home. In 2002, the Lions traded in their old Pontiac for a new Ford. Ford Field. Located in the heart of Detroit, Ford Field features massive skylights and large glass windows. The windows along the ceiling are frosted to mimic the automotive factories that are a staple in Michigan. The field itself is actually 45 feet below street level, a design meant to keep the stadium from sticking out within the downtown area. As for their past stadiums, Tiger Stadium was tore down in 2008. The Silver Dome was imploded in 2017 twice. The first attempt to blow it up didn't work, so they had to go back in a few days later, rewire it, and flip the switch again. Their second attempt clearly got the job done. Next up, Washington, who began as the Boston Braves back in 1932 and played their first year at Braves Field, home of MLB's Boston Braves. A year later, they were still on a baseball field, but now it was historic Fenway Park. Their name changed to the Boston Redskins. Fenway was supposed to be the site of the 1936 title game, but owner George Marshall was so mad about the poor attendance that year, he had them play the game against the Packers at the Polo Grounds in New York. 30,000 football fans turned out for the 1936 NFL Championship game at the Polo Grounds in New York. No shock then, that was their last season at Fenway. And in Massachusetts, for that matter, the team was off to Washington, D.C. and Griffith Stadium. Griffith was the site of the craziest pair of title games in NFL history. 1940, Washington loses to Chicago by a record score of 73 to zero. Two years later, same teams, Washington wins 14 to six. Sammy Ball, wearing his fame number 33, takes his time, selects his receiver, and pitches 38 yards to Moore, who takes it over his shoulder and the goal. As the 50s came to a close, though, Washington would settle in to what was the first major sports complex built to accommodate both baseball and football. Fans who flock to D.C. Stadium always enjoy the pregame and the halftime pageantry, highlighted by a space-age Santa Claus. 
RFK Memorial Stadium was opened up with President John F. Kennedy in the stands. Now at that time, the stadium was actually called District of Columbia Stadium or DC Stadium. It wasn't renamed Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium until 1969 as a way to honor the assassinated presidential candidate. As the 90s were coming to an end, owner Jack Kent Cooke completed a deal to move the team out of DC, taking them to Landover, Maryland. Jack Kent Cooke Stadium eventually renamed FedEx Field. The final whistle has sounded in Robert F. Kennedy Stadium. The end of an era is a time not only for nostalgia, but for prophecy. The place still has a marching band, which was the oldest in the league, formed back in 1937. There's the Hoggettes, of course, the loyalist of loyal fans who dress up in dresses and pig faces, a tradition they started in the 80s as a nod to the team's offensive line. The name got so big that restaurants would call us and say, we'll pick up the tab. One year after Washington joined the league, they were followed by the Philadelphia Eagles, who first played their games at the Baker Bowl. The Baker Bowl was yet another baseball field and was known by locals as the Cigar Box or sometimes the Band Box. Now, in those early years, the Eagles also played some random home games at Temple Stadium, Point Stadium, Laidley Field, and War Memorial Stadium too. None, though, were permanent. But overall, they played three seasons at the Baker Bowl before making their next jump, which saw them land at Philadelphia Municipal Stadium. Municipal Stadium was eventually renamed JFK Stadium decades later. The Eagles were long gone by then, though. They only stuck around for four seasons. They needed more room, or more seats to be precise, so they moved into one of the most unique stadiums in NFL history, Scheib Park. Here we are out at Scheib Park, and we weren't kidding when we said that it was really snowing. It's almost game time, and off comes the huge tarpaulin. Even the players lend a hand. 1948, the Eagles win their first NFL title at Scheib in a blinding snowstorm. The structure itself, French Renaissance. No way most people would guess it was a sports complex from out front, but it was. The MLB played there as well as the Eagles, who stayed there for almost 20 seasons, though they went back to Municipal Stadium for the 1941 season. And in 1943, it was the Eagles who had to merge with the Steelers due to World War II roster impacts. They went by the Steagles, splitting their home games between Scheib Park and Forbes Field. The Eagles stayed at Scheib, eventually renamed Connie Mack Stadium, until 1958. And from there, it was off to Franklin Field, another stadium Philly was crowned champion in. Tommy McDonald got the Eagles on the board in the second quarter. I uh, scored a lot of touchdowns in the, in the pros, but I think that will be the one that really will stick with me because I got it in there. I didn't let them down. Their stay at Franklin lasted over 20 years and was the site of the famous Santa getting booed by the fans episode. 1970 was the Eagles' final year at Franklin. Their new state-of-the-art facility was ready, the vet. And spoiler alert, they don't win any titles there. On September 26th, 1971, they came here for the Eagles' regular season debut in their new home. Veterans Stadium was given its name to honor vets of all wars. It featured seven levels, and it was its 700 level fans that were its most notorious. These guys are crazy, man. They want to fight all the time. But I love it. The place was legendary. It had Eagles Court. An actual judge was present at the stadium to deal with fans who were arrested on game days. And at one point, they had a mouse infestation that was so bad, they employed cats as mousers. Not a joke. The Eagles' occupancy of the vet lasted until 2002, making the move to the link in 2003. In a Monday night debut of their new stadium, the team from the city known for its fighting spirit called on a sacred South Philly icon for inspiration. So that's for Stella Rocky. You know, when you think Philadelphia, you have to think Rocky. What an appropriate time to bring out Stallone. What to know about Lincoln Financial Field. First, be very wary if you're going dressed in an opposing team's jersey. They may have won a Super Bowl, but that has not softened the Eagles faithful. More importantly, make sure you learn the words to the Eagles fight song, Fly Eagles Fly. The 
song was originally penned as Fight Eagles Fight, and it sort of fell by the wayside until the late 90s when an Eagles pet band played it in the parking lot of home games. The vet, by the way, met its demise in 2002 in a glorious 62 seconds. Crowds were everywhere as Philly slugger Greg Luzinski helped push the plunger. When it was all over, someone even played taps on a silver trumpet. Pennsylvania's other team came on the scene one season after the Eagles did, the Pittsburgh Steelers setting up shop at Forbes Field in 1933 as the Pittsburgh Pirates for their first seven years before changing to the Steelers. Forbes Field is ready for football as the Pittsburgh fans flock to see their Steelers tackle the St. Louis Cardinals. Each team is looking for its second victory of the season. Forbes Field was named after the street it was on, which was named after John Forbes, a British general of all things. The Steelers, unlike most other new teams, actually lasted in their first home stadium, playing there for over 30 seasons out of the gate. Again, the Steelers were part of two mergers in the 40s, playing some home games in 43 at Scheib Park as the Steagles, and some home games at Comiskey in 1944 as Card Pitt. They also played a few home games at the University of Pittsburgh starting in 1958, which eventually became their next permanent home. They played there for 11 seasons. By 1970, though, the city's replacement for Forbes Field was ready. The Steelers were headed to Three Rivers Stadium. The year before, Pittsburgh had won only two things, a football game and the right to the number one draft choice. Three Rivers is where the Steelers' dynasty was born, and it was the stadium where the immaculate reception happened. Last chance for the Steelers, and his pass is broken up by Tatum. Tipped off! Rachel Harris has it! And he's over! Whoa. Three Rivers also is where Steelers fans first broke out the terrible towel, debuting in 1975. But Three Rivers' time was up at the turn of the century. NFL teams were no longer content sharing venues with baseball teams, so they finally moved out on their own to Heinz Field. The Steelers carried their championship tradition to a new home in 2001, Heinz Field. first event ever held at Heinz Field, ironically nicknamed the Mustard Palace, was not a Steelers game. It was an NSYNC concert, but they didn't write Renegade, Styx did, and you need to know that song because they play it every game and the fans love it. The other reason to pay attention to the scoreboard anytime the Steelers score, Touchdown. the giant ketchup bottles tip a celebration ESPN deemed one of the top 10 in football. You also need to check out the Immaculate Reception Monument, as well as the Art Rooney statue located outside of Gate A. All of Pittsburgh's former parks are gone. Forbes Field was demolished back in 1971, Pitt Stadium fell by the wayside in 1999, and it was Three Rivers' turn to go in 2001. Talk about efficiency, too. It took just 19 seconds to reduce it to rubble. Okay, the Rams are up next, and they have given the Cardinals a run for their money as the NFL's Nomad Kings. They came onto the NFL scene in 1937 in Cleveland, splitting their home contest between Municipal Stadium and League Park. In 1938, they were still bouncing around, still playing at League Park, but also playing two of their home games at Shaw Stadium. Shaw Stadium, built for high school games. Imagine an NFL team today using a high school stadium for its home games. Anyway, the Rams were back at Municipal Stadium one year later. They stuck there for three seasons, their second time through though, but then it was back to League Park. The Rams' stay at League Park was interrupted by World War II. The team suspended operations in 1943, but it culminated in 1945 with a league title. King Winter takes over for the Pro Football Championship playoff at IC Cleveland Stadium. Cleveland's ace Bob Waterfield takes to the air, hits Jim Benton on the 12-yard line, and he goes over to give Cleveland an 8-7 lead as the crowd tries to keep from freezing. So it was finally time to hang some pictures on the wall and get settled in, right? Wrong. Not only did they not stay at League Park, they didn't even stick around in Cleveland, bolting for the sunny skies of Los Angeles and L.A. Memorial Coliseum. We started getting tremendous crowds. We would fill that uh, uh, Coliseum half the time, depending on the opponent. It was newspaper talk, Hollywood Rams. They automatically associated it with Hollywood. It was uh, undeserving because that uh, puts a connotation that you're kind of candy asses. L.A. Coliseum is a national historic landmark 
named in honor of LA veterans of World War I. It has that huge Olympic torch, which was added in 1930, specifically because it would host the Olympics in 1932. The Coliseum is also the site of the very first Super Bowl in 1967. In the Los Angeles Coliseum, the Packers met the Kansas City Chiefs of the AFL with Pro Football's World Championship at stake. The Rams' first stint at the Coliseum ran from 1946 to 1979, and then they were on the move once again, this time headed south to Anaheim Stadium. And here we go. The first game played here in the Rams' new home, Drew Hill from his own two-yard line to the 15. And breaking away, Murray missed him. He got away from Freedy. Touchdown! What a way to start the year! The Rams played at the Big A until 1994. Then it was time to pack up and head back east, this time settling down in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, when the 1995 season was kicking off, the dome that was being built for the Rams wasn't ready, so they had to play their first game at Bush Memorial Stadium. But no worries, it was nothing more than a delay. The Rams were ready to open the Trans World Dome just a short time later. If you build it, they will come. In record numbers, the team, the field, and the dream have come home to St. Louis. 65,598 fans came out to christen the new facility. Photo snatchers and frisbee catchers were all on hand to see the Carolina Panthers once again fall victim to the Rams. The Trans World Dome has gone by a number of names over the years, so locals just refer to it as the Dome, or sometimes the Battle Dome. They played 21 seasons there before moving out and heading once again back to LA returning to the Coliseum for four seasons while their new super high-tech home was being built, SoFi Stadium. Now we know what $5 billion can get you. Wow. SoFi Stadium holds 70,000 plus fans with the ability to expand to 100,000 plus for larger events. The centerpiece, the stadium's 2.2 million pound ovular, double-sided, 4K HDR video board that's suspended from the roof over the field. It also features a translucent ETFE roof, which in layman's terms means it's plastic. Okay, let's get back to Cleveland Municipal now, and we're not talking Rams ball anymore, we're talking Browns ball. The Browns started play in the NFL in 1950, but had been playing at Cleveland Municipal since 1946, when they were in the short-lived AAFC. They lasted there until 1995, the longest any team has played at one stadium from the start of their franchise's existence. This is also where the infamous Dog Pound was born. 1985 was the year cornerback Hanford Dixon started to refer to the defense as dogs, and along with fellow cornerback Frank Minifield, brought out a Dog Pound banner and hung it in front of the bleachers on the east side end zone. That was home to the cheap seats, and more importantly, some of the loudest fans at the stadium. Fans started dressing up in all sorts of dog attire, even bringing dog food to the stadium. They got some dogs out there, boy. Look at that big old number 98 over there. Now that's a dog over there. Hey, man. Fans in the section were so rowdy that in a 1989 game against the Broncos, the debris coming down from the dog pound was so bad, the referee made the teams switch sides so the Broncos didn't have to try and score on that side of the field. However, that put the wind at the Browns' back, and you guessed it, the game came down to a field goal attempt by Browns kicker Matt Barr that barely cleared the crossbar. The Browns have finally beaten the Broncos by one point. I'm going to see you in a few minutes, and I'm going to enjoy this win. I'll tell you, this is... This is great. Tell them, Daddy, you tell them. I'm going to see you enjoy this win, yeah. The good times at Cleveland Municipal would come to an end, though, in 1995. The city of Cleveland, yet again, being ditched by its home team when Art Modell took them to Baltimore. The city was promised a new team by 1999, but it had to have a new stadium, so Cleveland Municipal was demolished. Though it didn't go quietly, the stadium caught fire during demolition. But on that exact same spot, First Energy Stadium would rise from the ashes the Browns making their return to the NFL in 1999. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 1999 Cleveland Browns! The 
dog pound still resides on the east side of the stadium though, and remnants of their old home are actually still close by. 15,000 tons of debris from the demolition of Cleveland Municipal were dumped into Lake Erie to create artificial reefs. As of 2019 though, it is the only stadium in the league not to host a playoff game of any kind. The Falcons, Lions, and Jets all had at least a Super Bowl played at their venues. The 49ers were another team that jumped from the AAFC to the NFL in 1950, and when they did, they were playing at Kizar Stadium. Kizar wasn't just home to the 49ers and eventually the Raiders, it was also home of the Scorpio Killer, the infamous villain from the movie Dirty Harry. Anyway, the 49ers played there for over two decades. When the 70s rolled around, the Niners were ready to move into a bigger and more accessible stadium, so they moved to Candlestick Park. With new abilities over land came relative adjustments through the air. Wide receiver Gene Washington became a superstar. And in the new physical environment of Candlestick Park, he had his best day against the Patriots. The stadium name, it was built on Candlestick Point, which in turn was named after candlestick birds that inhabited the area. It holds the distinction as the last place the Beatles would ever play a concert in 1966. In football terms, it was also where the 49ers dynasty came to life. They played eight NFC championship games there, the first coming in 1981, and it featured what many say is the greatest play in NFL history. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark! Clark got a touchdown! Clark Clark has it! It's a touchdown for the 49ers! While the 49ers played at Candlestick until 2014, they did play one home game at Stanford Stadium in 1989. The Loma Prieta earthquake forced the Niners to host the New England Patriots at the college stadium. They did also play there for Super Bowl XIX, though technically it wasn't their home stadium, but still, it's the only venue to date where the host region saw its team win. Super Bowl XIX is in the record book, and Bill Walsh is being carried off on the shoulders of his players. Move ahead to 2014, and it was time for the 49ers to do what all NFL teams were doing, move out on their own. So it was time to say hello to Levi's Stadium. Tonight, the NFL comes to Silicon Valley as the San Francisco 49ers open their brand new home on Sunday Night Football. Nicknamed Home of the Faithful, Levi's Stadium makes the 49ers the team that plays the furthest from the city they're identified by. It's located in Santa Clara, which is 40 miles from San Francisco. They've got the catch statues that were unveiled following Dwight Clark's death in 2018. And then there's the rooftop farm, they actually grow 40 rotational crops on part of the roof, which are harvested for use in dishes served at the stadium. While Kizar Stadium was torn down and rebuilt, Candlestick was simply torn down. There was a plan at one point to implode it live during the Super Bowl in 2015, but eventually they decided to tear it down piece by piece. The Baltimore Colts joined the NFL in 1953 and spent their first three decades in the NFL playing at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, Maryland. National Football League Championship on the line at Baltimore. Favorites are the hometown Colts, out to become the fourth team in league history to win two straight playoff titles. Memorial Stadium was known by many names. It went by Baltimore Stadium, Venable Stadium, it was changed to Babe Ruth Stadium for a bit in the wake of Ruth's death, being he was a Baltimore native. And then there were the nicknames, the Old Gray Lady of 33rd Street, and maybe the greatest nickname any stadium has ever had, the world's largest outdoor insane asylum, a moniker earned due to how passionate, and some would say a little crazy, its fans were. It was also the site of one of the more bizarre accidents any NFL stadium has ever been a part of. The Colts had just finished losing to the Steelers in a playoff game in 1976 when a small plane tried to buzz the stadium. What happened here today, sir? What happened? Well, it's very difficult to say at this time. Luckily, the game was a blowout, so most fans were long gone when the plane crashed. Thankfully, there were no serious injuries. The pilot, of course, was arrested after the incident. The Colts played their final season at Memorial Stadium and Baltimore all together in 1983, heading to Indianapolis and the RCA Dome. 
In the heart of downtown Indianapolis lies a new symbol of the city's dynamic growth. It is the Hoosier Dome. Originally named the Hoosier Dome, it was yet another one of those stadiums with one of those air pressured roofs. The RCA Dome also had a reputation for being one of the loudest stadiums in the game. These 57,000 people, they got into it late in the game, they helped this defense. Tom Brady and company were a little unsure if all that noise though was really coming from the fans. Even today, Brady still has some doubts. He recently got asked about the noise they pump into his practices. I thought it was one of the Colts old tapes that when they used to pump all that sound in the RCA dome, so. The league did investigate whether the Colts fan noise was being aided by their sound system and they were cleared of any wrongdoing. That all was right, a joke, everybody. Just want to make that clear. The Colts run at the dome ran until 2008. Their new digs, Lucas Oil Stadium. This is the NFL's newest venue, Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, where 63,000 fans are ready for Peyton Manning and the Colts. Lucas Oil has a retractable roof, a red brick exterior, and a massive window wall. The place is beautiful. They moved the 2006 Lombardi Trophy they won around the stadium each week. And of course, they honored the guy that helped bring it to them with a statue out front of the stadium. And right before every game, someone pounds an anvil to kick things off. As to their former residences, both were reduced to rubble, Memorial Stadium being torn down in 2001 and the RCA Dome meeting its demise via implosion in 2008. Okay, Cowboy fans, it's your turn. And your turn started in 1960 at the Cotton Bowl. The Cowboys are in good shape as they face the Philadelphia Eagles under the Cotton Bowl lights. Dallas's first year at the Cotton Bowl did not go so great. They went 0-11-1 in their inaugural season, so they won zero home games. The Cowboys stuck around at the house that Dope built until 1971, when they were finally ready to move out of the college venue and into their own place, Texas Stadium. Texas Stadium, a jewel mounted in the flatlands of Dallas, was the finest football facility in the world and the new home of the Cowboys. Texas Stadium was best known for the giant hole in its roof, though that design wasn't part of the original plan. It was supposed to be a retractable dome, but they realized that the roof structure could not support a retractable dome on that stadium. Plus, according to Cowboys fans, the hole allowed God to watch his favorite team play on Sundays. That hole also created unique playing conditions. Anyone who ever watched a Cowboys home game on TV remembers it. There were all these crazy shadows on the field that made it tough on the players at times and for the television cameras. Texas Stadium was home to the boys from 1971 to 2008, but like most stadiums, it had become old and outdated. So the Cowboys made the jump to Jerry World. September 20th, 2009 was one of the finest Sundays in the storied history of the Dallas Cowboys. When Cowboys Stadium threw open its doors, Cowboys Stadium, since renamed AT&T Stadium, finished what Texas Stadium started, being built with a fully retractable roof. First stadium ever built with a construction cost surpassing a billion dollars. It's famous for its massive video board hung in the middle of the stadium that's actually gotten in on the action a few times. It's only a 33 yard punt. Take a look at this, there's the ball. Does it touch the bottom of the board? I think it does. The video board even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records as being the largest HD video display in the world. That scoreboard is seven stories high. It weighs a million, 200,000 pounds. It really is remarkable. Legend has it, the stadium uses more electricity than the entire country of Liberia. While it typically holds 80,000 people, if you add in standing room, it jumps to over 100,000. It currently holds the NFL record for attendance. 2009, 105,121 fans in to see the Cowboys take on the Giants. The stadium has also been referred to as the Death Star, the Palace in Dallas, the Cowboys Cathedral, among others. As for its previous home, it's no longer. The Cowboys held a national essay contest with the winner getting to pull the trigger. An 11-year-old won it. It took just 25 seconds for the old stadium to fall. The team of tomorrow in the National Football League is the Buffalo Bills. 
We now reach the point where it's time to look at teams that made their debuts in the AFL, starting with the Buffalo Bills, who first played their games at War Memorial Stadium. The Rock Pile, as fans called it, had some of the coolest entrances of any stadium you'll see. And even after it was demolished, they preserved two of the four gates. War Memorial was pretty small by NFL standards. So after the leagues merged, up went their new home, where the Bills first kicked off a game in 1973. And let's hear it for the Bills! Let's hear it! Come on! Let's go! Buffalo Stadium started out as Rich Stadium, named after Rich Products, a Buffalo-based food company. After that, the stadium was named after its owner, Ralph Wilson, then took on the name of the hat company that bought the naming rights, and at this moment is simply known as Bills Stadium, though many fans still refer to it as the Ralph. The stadium is notorious for its windy conditions, due to being located downwind from Lake Erie. But when you go to a game there, it's as much about what goes on outside the stadium before the game, because that's where you'll find the infamous Bills Mafia at its craziest. It's all about the heart, baby. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. Yeah! Bill's Mafia is what the team's most religious fans have been calling themselves since 2010, and their tailgating antics are some of the strangest you'll find anywhere, starting with superfan Ron Pinto, who you also hear referred to as Ketchup Kenny, because, well, see for yourself. <laughs> And the last thing you need to know about Bill's Stadium is it might be haunted. These are the kinds of legends you get when you build a stadium next to a cemetery. Let's head west now to the Rockies, home of the Denver Broncos, whose first home was Denver University's Hilltop Stadium. They had to play a few games there while more seats were being added to their permanent home, Bears Stadium. Bears Stadium, where tens of thousands viewed some of the most entertaining football played anywhere. Mile High Stadium was originally named Bears Stadium because that was the name of the minor league baseball team that first inhabited the field. It didn't take on the iconic Mile High name until 1969. It was in 1975 when the team added the 27-foot Bucky the Broncos sculpture to its scoreboard. The Broncos galloped around the stadium for the better part of four decades and then made the move to the only other stadium they've played in, located right next door, known today as Empower Field at Mile High. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Everybody in the nation gets to see the best stadium in America. Empower Field started out as Invesco Field, then changed to Sports Authority Field, followed by Broncos Stadium at Mile High, before taking on its current name. Anyway, the basics for Mile High, of course, there's the altitude, which makes it tough on opposing players who aren't used to the thin air, but makes it amazing if you're a kicker. For the all-time mark from 64, Matt Prater's kick is good! History is made! Matt Prater's 64-yarder and NFL record was made in Denver. Bucky the Bronco is still perched up on top of the scoreboard. He made the move with the team. He's not alone either, out front, make sure you check out his buddies. But the coolest thing about the new mile high might be what you can't see. As the story goes, two out-of-town contractors working there during renovations in 2013 buried a Neil Smith Kansas City Chiefs jersey somewhere near the 50-yard line as a way to curse the team. Didn't really work though, as the Broncos won the AFC Championship game there on the way to a Super Bowl win just two years later. Rolling, it's rolling, it's tipped in the air! And as for the old Mile High, it's now a parking lot for the new Mile High. You can still check out a miniature version of the stadium, which can be found outside the new stadium. As long as we're sitting here, why don't uh, you join me in watching a little bit of this execution and timing? I'd love this to. Film. Very good. When the Kansas City Chiefs played their first game in the AFL in 1960, they weren't the Chiefs, and they weren't in Kansas City. They were the Texans, and they played their games in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. The Chiefs have the ball in the second half, and it looks like they're about to rally. As we just mentioned, the Cowboys were also playing their games at the Cotton Bowl as well, so the timeshare of the stadium and the city wasn't gonna last. The Chiefs played three seasons there before making their move. 1963 saw the team leave their stadium, city, and name behind, taking up residency at Municipal Stadium in Kansas City, Missouri. Professional football, that most fascinating, most exciting of all spectator sports, 
came to Mid-America in 1963 when the Dallas Texans became the Kansas City Chiefs. Municipal Stadium was home of MLB's then Kansas City Athletics. The Chiefs played there until 1972, and their final game was historic. The Chiefs hosted the Dolphins on Christmas Day in the only playoff game KC would ever play at the stadium. Kansas City lost to Miami in double overtime on a Garo Yepremian walk-off field goal. The game lasted 82 minutes, 40 seconds. Municipal Stadium, the site of what is still the longest NFL game ever played. Oh, no. No, no. no matter how good the Chiefs were playing at Municipal, it was too small, and that prompted the construction of their new and current home, Arrowhead Stadium. Arrowhead, along with Soldier Field, by the way, the only stadiums in the NFL not named after a person or a sponsor company. The field sits three stories below ground level and was the first to include arrows on the field on the yard markers to indicate the nearest goal line. The NFL would make that mandatory for all fields starting in 1978. Arrowhead's notoriety, though, isn't based on those markers, but for the volume. And the crowd, as you can tell, completely involved in the ballgame entirely different than the first half. 1990, Broncos were in town. John Elway and company are backed up near the end zone, and the crowd was so loud, he turned to the ref to get him to quiet the crowd down. Arrowhead's rep as noise kings continued on. 2014, in comes Tom Brady and the Patriots. Watch them. The noise. And Arrowhead and its fans hit 142.2 decibels, which got them into the Guinness Book of World Records. They broke the record, so Arrowhead wears this crown as the loudest stadium in the world again. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Air Coriel and your pilot, Welcome to San Diego. When the Chargers opened up play in 1960, it was in LA at the Coliseum. But their stay there and in the city only lasted one year before they jumped on the freeway and headed south to the equally sunny skies of San Diego, first playing their home games at Balboa Stadium. Balboa is one of the few early football stadiums that wasn't built with baseball in mind, even though baseball was played there. But as was the case with every stadium in those years, it was too small. So no shock, the city built a new facility, San Diego Stadium. For a record number, 300,000 Charger fans, bright, bold San Diego Stadium was where the action was. San Diego Stadium eventually went by Jack Murphy Stadium, shortened to the Murph. Then it was Qualcomm, or the Q. And now it's San Diego Community Credit Union Stadium. In 1978, they installed a brand new scoreboard, the first full-colored outdoor scoreboard ever built. The Chargers San Diego home is the only stadium to ever host both the World Series and the Super Bowl in the same year, a feat that took place in 1998. The Chargers stay in San Diego came to an end in 2016, ownership making the decision to move back to LA, their temporary home, the StubHub Center. It's the Chargers' first home game of 2017 and their first regular season home game in L.A. since 1960. Man, even though they weren't going to play there long, seeing a game at the StubHub Center, now known as Dignity Health Sports Park, was like going back in time. It was built for soccer, so it only holds 27,000 fans, meaning no matter where you're sitting, you have a great view of the field. Touchdown, Antonio Gates! But it was never supposed to last. The Chargers, like the Rams, just waiting for SoFi to be completed. The Chargers about to make their debut at their new home. This place is awesome. It's unbelievable. You called it Disneyland when we got here, and I know you're out here getting a lot of rides in this morning. So. <laughs> Staying in California, but again rewinding to 1960. We're talking Raiders, and we are back at Kizar Stadium. Oakland played the first four games of its existence at Kizar in the AFL's inaugural season, but they didn't finish the season there, instead moving over to Candlestick Park for the last four games of the year and staying there through 1961. Plans to build the Oakland Coliseum were underway, but it wouldn't be ready until 1966, and the Raiders were an Oakland team, not a San Francisco team. So a temporary stadium was built back in Oakland. Starting in 1962, they played at Frank Ewell Field. 
Frank Ulefeel was named after an undertaker in Oakland. And it adds to everything else that was going on at that time uh, in, the, in the American Football League. Because everybody was trying to bury them, there's no question about it, and they just kept coming back to life. But after six seasons in existence, the Raiders were finally ready to move to a permanent home. The Oakland Coliseum was ready to go. 1966 was a remarkable year for the Oakland Raiders. It was the year the Raiders moved at long last into their magnificent new home, the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum. The Coliseum's field is 21 feet below sea level. The Raiders played there from 1966 to 1981, though there was that one game they had to use Berkeley's Memorial Stadium in 1973. The Miami Dolphins, led by coach Don Shula, were out to break a record by winning 19 straight games. A scheduling conflict with the A's forced the move, so fans at the college stadium got to see the Raiders beat the Dolphins 12 to seven, which snapped Miami's 18 game winning streak at the time. But you know the story, Al Davis packed up his team and headed south for Los Angeles, trading one Coliseum for another in 1982. Davis though would eventually tire of the conditions at LA's Coliseum no different than he did with Oakland's. That's why it shocked so many people when he went back north in 1995, going right back to the stadium they were in when they left in 81. The Oakland Coliseum went through a number of name changes in their second stint there, but the name it became known for, specifically the southern section of the stadium, is none other than the Black Hole. Hey, baby, it's about pain. Dressing up isn't the only thing Raiders fans are known for. They've got their Just Win Baby rally cry coined by Davis himself. Just win, baby. And there's their pregame tradition of honoring their late owner, the lighting of the Al Davis Memorial Torch, first lit by Raiders legend John Madden in 2011. The fire that burns brightest in the organization is the will to win. That torch was packed in the moving van for their new home, too. The Raiders' most recent move, taking them to Las Vegas. The 188th different National Football League venue. $1.9 billion, 10 levels, clear roof, the largest 3D printed object in the world, huge retractable curtain-like windows facing the Las Vegas Strip, rolling natural grass just like the Cardinal Stadium, black exterior of course, and the torch, even bigger, 93 feet tall. Yes, 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 yes. Let's head back east now. The Jets, known as the Titans of New York in 1960, started off playing their games at the Polo Grounds. The worst damn place I ever saw. It had been run down. They didn't clean it up or anything. Made me sick just to go out on the field. The Jets played at the Polo Grounds until 1964. They hold the distinction as being the last team to ever play at the stadium. Their game against the Bills on December 14, 1963, the stadium's final curtain call. The Jets' next stop, Shea Stadium. The Titans ready for a new change of scenery and a new name. The largest opening day crowd in AFL history, 53,000 strong, swells Shea Stadium in New York City. When we opened Shea Stadium, the World's Fair was still going on. The New York World's Fair has been visited by 51 million people. There was so much traffic, people abandoned their cars on the Grand Central Parkway. Shea Stadium is the main reason the team changed its name to the Jets. Goodbye, New York! Don't give up, New York! It was located in the middle of New York's two biggest airports. The team, though, got tired of taking a back seat to the Mets' schedule, so they took off to the Meadowlands. Bill Kenny drops straight back the pass. Wallace knocked away for Rosen in the end zone. Touchdown, New York Jets! Their official residency at Giants Stadium began in 1984, though they first played there as the home team in some games starting in 1977. The Jets played two games a year at the Meadowlands as sort of renters before finally moving in permanently. It was at Giants Stadium that Fireman Ed found his persona. As Fireman Ed gets the Jet fans fired up, the Jets' most famous fans started showing up to games there in 1986. Because the stadium has two teams playing at it, it ended up surpassing Wrigley Field in 2003 as the stadium to host the most NFL games ever. In 2010, though, the Giants and Jets both moved across the parking lot into MetLife Stadium, originally called New Meadowland Stadium. 
and you're going to feel it and hear it and see it all in high definition as the Jets and the Ravens from the new Meadowland Stadium. Aside from the different colors present when the Jets are the host team, there's also those jets, or sometimes helicopters, which do flyovers before each game. And there's also their chant, which we've all heard before, but just for good measure, let's hear it again, Jets fans. To New England now, the Patriots, who went by the Boston Patriots when they burst onto the scene, opened their existence at Boston University's Nickerson Field. The season opened on a warm, pleasant night, just a stone's throw from the hallowed halls of Harvard University. Nickerson Field, the site of the very first ever regular season AFL game played between the Patriots and the Denver Broncos. In 1963, though, they moved things over to Fenway Park. Nickerson was too small. The Patriots, the third professional team to call the historic baseball field home. It's the Patriots Fenway Park home opener. Just in case you ever wondered, Fenway Park got its name from the Fens, a nearby park. Fenway, of course, was home of the Red Sox, so like the Jets, the Pats were stuck on the road to start the season a lot. It was so bad in 1967, New England was the home team in a game against the Chargers in San Diego. And in 1968, they were the home team against the Jets at Legion Field in Alabama. Fenway, though, was never intended to be their permanent home. They played there through the 1968 season and then started playing their home games at Boston College's Alumni Stadium starting in 1969. For 1970, it was another college, this time Harvard Stadium, serving as their home. And then finally, in 1971, their permanent home was ready. It was time to hang some pictures on the walls for once. Foxborough Stadium was ready for action. During 1971, over half a million fans provided tribute to their team in a beautiful new stadium. At first, Foxborough was called Schaefer Stadium and then Sullivan Stadium before being named after the city of Foxborough, though new owner Robert Kraft chose to spell it differently, leaving the UGH out. They also left permanent bathrooms out. The facility had issues with plumbing and were forced to use portable toilets for the stadium's entire existence. Any stadium with access issues and with inadequate plumbing wasn't going to last, so the Patriots built themselves a new pad, Gillette Stadium. What a facility, and to think that four years ago, Robert Kraft had announced that the Patriots were moving to Hartford, Connecticut. Games at the Razor, as it's known by locals, almost feel like parties. They crank Bon Jovi's Our House after every scoring play. And their end zone militia also likes to get in on the act. The 16-story stadium also has a 130-foot replica lighthouse that sounds off when the other team has a third down. As of the end of 2019, the Patriots had sold Gillette out for every single home game of its existence. Foxborough, by the way, serves as Gillette's parking lot now. After 31 seasons as New England's home, the stadium was demolished in 2002. The final original founding member of the AFL, the Houston Oilers, who of course today are known as the Tennessee Titans. The Oilers' first stadium, University of Houston's Jefferson Stadium. Jefferson Stadium, or Robertson Stadium, was another multi-purpose stadium originally built in 1904. It was the site of the very first AFL championship game won by the Oilers. Their stay there was brief though, hopping from one college campus to another after five seasons. Next up was the much bigger Rice Stadium. The Oilers' stay at Rice was even shorter than their stay at Jefferson though. They only played at Rice for three seasons. The team's owner, Bud Adams, struck a deal that would put his young team in the record books. The Oilers, the first professional football team to have a home with a roof. The Oilers moved to Houston's famous Astrodome. The fans showed instant approval by tripling season ticket sales from 10,000 to 30,000 in a startling two months period. Oilers Chiefs, September of 1968, the Astrodome. First time an AFL or NFL team hosted a game inside at a stadium that was their permanent home. The Oilers were also the first professional football team to play on AstroTurf. Footnote, the stadium was originally flush with real grass. The grass grew pretty well for uh, a little while, but the Houston Astros, the outfielders were having a difficult time 
reading the ball because of the light coming in from the roof. So they got up there and started painting some of those panels and what happened is the grass died because it wasn't getting the sunlight. They played at the Astrodome till 1996. Adams taking his club to Tennessee the next year, playing their inaugural season at the Liberty Bowl. Good afternoon and welcome as opening day comes to Memphis, Tennessee. Today, the Oakland Raiders go against the now Tennessee Oilers on a hot, sultry day in the Mid-South. Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium, home of the Memphis Tigers. The Oilers had a new stadium in the works in Nashville, but it wasn't gonna be ready until 1999. The plan was to play at the Liberty Bowl until then, but Memphis fans didn't really care much about a team that wasn't gonna stick around. The season was a disaster. The stands were half full at best for most of their games. So after their final game of 1997, they moved over to Vanderbilt Stadium in Nashville where they would play the 1998 season. They've had three homes in three years, but the Oilers are finally in Nashville with their new stadium ready for next season. They only needed the facility for one year, and what fans probably remember about their one-year run there, you couldn't buy beer. That's right, an NFL game with no beer. In 1999, the Oilers were no more. They had made the switch to the Titans, and they were finally ready to move into their permanent Tennessee home, Adelphia Coliseum. And welcome everyone to Adelphia Coliseum here in Nashville, Tennessee for the first ever game of the Tennessee Titans. The Titans won their first 13 games at Adelphia, an NFL record for consecutive wins at a new stadium since the merger in 1970. The name of the stadium was changed to the Coliseum, an LP field, before taking up its most recent moniker, Nissan Stadium. You'll hear plenty of Titan Up from fans there. And there's also the 12th Titan tradition. A former player or celebrity comes out and plants a large sword at the 50 yard line before kickoff of each game. The NFL had wanted a team back in Minnesota for years and finally got their wish when the Vikings began play in Metropolitan Stadium. Now thanks to the folks who make Grain Belt beer, you're going to see some highlights from the Vikings' first year in the National Football League. The Vikings and MLB's twins both began playing at the Old Met there back in 1961. The Vikings stayed there for 20 seasons. After that, they moved into another Met, but this one had a roof. The Minnesota Vikings were moving indoors to the Metrodome. Live from the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome in Minneapolis, the Minnesota Vikings and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The 1982 NFL season, the 63rd in the National Football League, is underway. The, the Dome, or the Thunderdome as it was commonly called, was another dome stadium to use one of those fiberglass air pressured roofs, which would end up being part of its undoing. But before we get to that, check this out. Remember Tony Dorsett's Monday Night Football 99-yard run? Stays inbound! Can you believe that? How about Antonio Cromartie taking a missed field goal back 109 yards? 10-5, touchdown! Then there was this Bernard Berrien 99-yard TD reception. And the former Bear will go 99 yards for a touchdown! Oh, and let's not forget Corder L. Patterson's 109-yard kickoff return. He can't get him and all the way for a touchdown. The Metrodome, home to the longest TD run and TD pass in NFL history, both tied for first for what that's worth, and the two longest plays, period. Crazy, right? But back to that roof. 2010, a huge storm hit the area and the whole roof ended up collapsing. The Vikings had two home games left. The first was moved to Detroit. The Vikings were the home team while playing the Giants at Lions Ford Field. Woo! Vikings, baby! We're bear hunting tonight. For their last home game, they were back in state, playing the Bears at TCF Bank Stadium, where the Minnesota Gophers play. By the time they left the dome, they dealt with five roof collapses. The Vikings would play their final game there in 2013. They had a new place in the works, but it wasn't going to be ready until 2014 or 15 for that matter. So the Vikings continued borrowing TCF. But by 2016, U.S. Bank Stadium was ready to open its doors, and these were some special doors they were opening. What a buzz in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota tonight as U.S. Bank Stadium opens its doors to its first regular season game. At 40,000 tons, 55 feet wide, and 95 feet high, U.S. Bank's massive glass pivoting doors are the largest of its kind in the world. It was the first NFL stadium to feature a translucent roof. 
outside the stadium, there's a giant Viking ship to make sure you know whose house you're visiting. Inside the stadium, each game is kicked off with someone blowing their famous gala horn. You'll hear the horn throughout the game, along with plenty of skull chants, fans yelling it as they clap their hands over their heads, a nice loud drum keeping the beat. And feel free to dress up like a Viking. Game day garb is strongly encouraged at the new Star of the North. What a very Games of thrones nickname, right? But appropriate for a stadium full of fans wearing Helga hats and carrying fake swords. Both the Vikings' previous permanent homes are gone, by the way. The old Met Metropolitan Stadium was demolished in 1985, and the Metrodome met its demise in 2014. 42 explosive charges were set off at once to begin the deconstruction process. It took 4,910 truckloads to clear it all out when it was all said and done. Georgia, another state the NFL had been eyeballing for some time. The Falcons, the franchise to make its nest in the South, starting off at Atlanta Stadium. Most everybody knows Atlanta is a growing city. We have a new stadium. The stands are completely full at every game. They bring people in from all out over the Southeast. I've been to one Atlanta Falcon football game, and I would have loved to go to the other ones, but I couldn't get a ticket. It was known early on as the miracle on Capitol Avenue because of the role it played in landing both the Falcons and the Braves. The Falcons flew the coop after the 1991 season, heading over to the Georgia Dome. The skyline of Atlanta got a new addition in 1992. And to inaugurate the Georgia Dome, the Atlanta Falcons had a full house. We will light this place up. First play, maybe. Chris Miller will throw on first down, deep down the near sideline. Michael Haynes is there. He's got it at the 30, at the 20. He could go. Hey, 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 hey. Touchdown, <laughs> Falcons. The Falcons' new home, complete with a roof, a Teflon-coated fiberglass roof, Though, other than a minor issue from a rainstorm, it didn't cause too many problems. The Georgia Dome was the place to host big events for a while. No other stadium has ever hosted the Olympics, the Final Four, and the Super Bowl, which it did twice. The Falcons themselves sent the Dome out in style, too. The 2016 NFC Championship game, the final game ever played at the Georgia Dome. The fans into it here in Atlanta, final game of the Georgia Dome. When the NFL calendar flipped to 2017, Atlanta was ready to start enjoying the comforts of their newly built Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's opening night at the NFL's newest facility, Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, as the Green Bay Packers take the field, all set to face the Falcons on Sunday night football. Mercedes-Benz went up 83 feet away from the old dome. It was built with a retractable roof, takes about eight minutes to open or shut it. They also built a massive 73,000 pound Falcon out front that at over four stories tall, makes him the biggest bird in the world. Inside, you'll find another biggest in the world when you look up at their 360 degree Halo HD video display, a first of its kind. Be ready to have fans yell, rise up at you or in brotherhood, both well-known Atlanta mottos that echo throughout the building on game days. And of course, you might have heard about their cheap eats. Owner Arthur Blank wanting the price of his concession stands to be the cheapest of any major sports venue. If you go looking for Atlanta's old residences, you won't find either. Demolition of Fulton County Stadium started five years after it was vacated, the implosion taking place in 1997. The Georgia Dome was also blown up twice. The first set of charges took down most of the stadium, but the eastern wall and the northwest gate didn't go down, ultimately because the charges they set didn't fire correctly. So a month after the first try, they finished the job and the dome was no more. Hey, Blake! Blake! Get in there! Let's go! We're yeah! The Miami Dolphins joined the AFL in 1966, playing their home games at the Orange Bowl and they couldn't have gotten off to a better start. The Dolphins debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. First game in Dolphins franchise history, first home game, first play, a 95-yard kickoff return by Joe Auer. Only two franchises in pro football history have pulled that off. We'll get to the other one shortly. For three seasons, the team brought in an actual Dolphin, Flipper, who would swim around a water tank and do tricks after the team scored. Whenever the Dolphins score, Flipper would go up and jump through 
the hoop, they decided they didn't score enough, so he would jump up on first downs. The Dolphins themselves were dominant at the Orange Bowl. They once strung together a 31-game home winning streak there from 1971 to 1975, which included the perfect season of 1972. They've given up the least points in the NFL. They've scored the most. Miami played at the Bowl from 1966 to 1986. Then it was off to their new pad, known at the time as Joe Robbie Stadium. They came dressed for the beach, as well as the ball, to usher in the new era in Dolphin history, the long-awaited opening of Joe Robbie Stadium. Holy naming rights, Batman. From Joe Robbie to Pro Player Park, to Pro Player Stadium, to Dolphin Stadium, to Dolphin Stadium. Seriously, they just got rid of the S. To Land Shark Stadium, my personal favorite, back to Dolphin Stadium, to Sun Life Stadium, to New Miami Stadium, and now most recently to Hard Rock Stadium. One stadium, nine different names and counting. Call it whatever you'd like, Doll Fans. That's what their fan base is known as, Doll Fans. They've had the pleasure of seeing a ton of big events there. Two World Series, four BCS era national championship games, and six Super Bowls. The stadium is also known for all the art you'll find throughout the venue. They brought in artists from 10 different countries to help spice things up around the joint. So make sure you check out the perfect moment statue showing Don Shula being carried off the field. And then there's Dan Marino, their iconic QB of the 80s and 90s. Way down yonder where the great Mississippi River reaches the Louisiana Bayou stands the grand old southern city of New Orleans. Let's head to Louisiana now. The New Orleans Saints making their NFL debut in 1967 at Tulane Stadium. And like the Dolphins, they too kicked things off with a bang. John Gilliam opened the Saints' tenure at Tulane Stadium by taking the opening kickoff to the house 94 yards. The college stadium was so well regarded in those early years, it was the host site for Super Bowls 4, 6, and 9. Though 9 was supposed to be held at the Superdome, but it wasn't ready in time. It was, however, ready in 1975, so after eight seasons at the college venue, it was time to move indoors. Now, of course, we've got the fantastic Superdome, which without a doubt is the very finest in all the sports. Even from a distance, fans of all ages marvel at the space age splendor of the Louisiana Superdome. Mercedes-Benz Superdome, which at the moment I'm reading this is on the way out as a name, the naming rights up for bid. But no matter what you call it, it's the largest fixed dome structure in the world. As well known as it is for Saints football, it also famously became a safe haven for people displaced by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. But that also meant the Saints had to borrow some nearby homes. They played four games at Tiger Stadium, three games at the Alamo Dome. The next week, the team returned to their home away from home, where the community of San Antonio welcomed the Saints as if they were their own. And one game at Giants Stadium, where they played the visiting Giants. Heads is the coin, it is tails. New Orleans will receive the roll. The Superdome, though, has hosted its fair share of Super Bowls, an NFL record seven of them. Welcome to Super Bowl 12. I'm Pat Summerall with Tom Brookshire. And well, as you can see, the Superdome is stuffed. The most recent, the Harbaugh Bowl, the Ravens edging San Francisco in Super Bowl 47, which of course featured a little electrical problem. Half the power in New Orleans Stadium, the Superdome here, is out. But as for games with the Saints as hosts, be ready for a lot of costumes. The Big Easy Mafia, as they're known in some circles, love to get done up for games. And they love their team chant. Who Dat was actually a fight song that started in the 60s, though it wasn't originally written for the Saints. It was for a high school team. But a couple word tweaks here and there, and the rest is history. It's become so popular, it's led many in their fan base to adopt the nickname of Kudat Nation. The Cincinnati Bengals, who came onto the scene in the AFL in 1968, played their first games at the outset at Nippert Stadium. The first to fall prey were the skitterish Denver Broncos. In their first home game of the season, the Bengals attacked the Broncos like so much fresh meat on the hook. Nipper is the home field of the Cincinnati Bearcats. The Bengals just needed to use it for a couple seasons while their permanent home was being built. That home, Riverfront Stadium, 
home of the Reds and Bengals starting in 1970. Sam White performed like a time-tested veteran instead of like a rusty reserve. His elusive running and leadership appeared to win him the quarterback job. Sam Weish scored the very first TD at Riverfront, eventually renamed Synergy Field, in their very first home game. More on Weish in a second. Uniquely, the field didn't have the team logo on it at midfield or riding in the end zone of any kind, not until the late 90s anyway. It's also where the coldest game in NFL history was played, if you account for wind chill, Packers fans. We're talking a wind chilled 59 degrees below zero. The 1981 AFC Championship game is known today as the Freezer Bowl. The air temperature was negative nine degrees at kickoff, whereas the Ice Bowl played in Green Bay in 1967 was minus 13. But the wind chill temp in Cincinnati that day, as you just heard, was negative 59 degrees. Cold weather would also play a role in another one of Riverfront's most memorable games. Let's fast forward to the 1989 season. Weish is now their head coach. It was another cold day, and the Seahawks were in town, and fans were keeping themselves warm by throwing snowballs at Seattle players, which apparently didn't sit well with Weish. Will the next person that sees anybody throw anything onto this field, point them out, or get them out of here? You don't live in Cleveland! You live in Cincinnati! Bengals' stay there came to an end after 1999. With the new century would come a new Bengals' home. It was time to welcome in the jungle. Players aspired to take their place on the plateau of excellence established by the founder of the franchise. Paul Brown Stadium shares two qualities with Lambeau Field. They are the only stadiums with five miles of piping underneath for heating. And they are the only two named after a person. You should make sure you know the lyrics to Welcome to the Jungle before showing up to a game there, because they will play that before every kickoff. And if you're a first-time visitor, don't be confused when the fans start chanting, Who Day? You're not in New Orleans. Who Day? Who Day? Who Day? They gonna beat them bangles! Who Day? While Who Dat is the Saints mantra, Who Day is Cincy's. And because it sounds so similar, there have been some debates over who came up with it first. The Bengals seem to be able to trace theirs back to 1980. Saints fans, though, even if it was first a high school song, say theirs is at least a decade older. Riverfront, by the way, imploded in 2002. The most challenging part, the new Great American Ballpark, was about 24 feet away, complete with hundreds of floor-to-ceiling windows. But they said not a single window was even cracked by Riverfront's demolition. Off to the Northwest now, the Seattle Seahawks jumping on board in 1976 and breaking onto the scene in one of the loudest stadiums the game has ever seen. Number 81, John McMakin. The King County Multipurpose Domed Stadium, AKA the Kingdom. It didn't just house the Hawks and Mariners. The NBA's Supersonics also called it home, making it the only stadium to permanently house an NFL, MLB, and NBA team. It was considered one of the OG loud stadiums, if you will. The game has taken over the kingdom. It began here in Seattle, the University of Washington, and they do it, I guess, basically to perfection. They're quite proud of it. In fact, this is where the 12s were born. The 12s are what Seahawks fans call themselves, the number 12 actually being retired by the team in 1984. Part of the reason the 12 sounded so loud was they had a roof to work with, but as we've seen, roofs can cause issues. In 1994, during baseball season, some ceiling tiles had become waterlogged from too much pressure washing and they collapsed. It forced the Seahawks to play their first three games of the season at Husky Stadium, which they would again use later but their residency at the Kingdom overall lasted over 20 seasons. The Seahawks got a new stadium approved as the year 2000 approached, but it wasn't gonna be ready until 2002, and it was gonna be built right where the Kingdom was located. So they went back to crashing on the couch of the Huskies for two seasons. But in 2002, Seahawks Stadium was ready, and so were its fans who were as loud as ever. Seahawks Stadium has gone through a couple name changes, Quest Field and now Century Link Field, but what it's truly known for is its volume knob. As the offense having a tough time hearing because of the noise from the 12th man. It's called the 12th, the 12th people, whatever it's called, and boy, I tell you, 
They're on fire. It has been in the Guinness Book of World Records twice for being the loudest stadium, though Arrowhead has since reclaimed that title. CenturyLink Field was built to be loud. The unique truss design helps trap all the noise made by the fans. The 12s once helped cause 11 false starts in a single game back in 2005. False start offense number 66. That's nine false starts. The 12 flag also has become a CenturyLink field tradition, the flag being raised before each game by a celebrity or former player. Fans there also can claim they were so loud they literally shook the stadium. Marshawn Lynch's famous run against the Saints in 2011 was dubbed Beastquake because the shaking of the stadium ended up registering with the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network. What a run! Marshawn Lynch for the touchdown! Ah. And so did the Kingdome when it was imploded in 2000. And what an implosion it was. 16.8 seconds, and it did trigger an actual earthquake too registering 2.3 on the Richter scale. It's Buccaneer football. Bang, bang, bang. Wow. Let's travel all the way across the country now. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers joining the NFL the same year Seattle did. The Bucks kicking things off at Tampa Stadium in 1976. Tampa Stadium may be the most unlucky start to a homestand you'll ever hear about in all of sports. No wins for almost two full seasons. 26 game losing streak to start out as a franchise and NFL record. Snapped the streak in week 13 of 1977, but on the road. And then finally, last day of the season, it happened in Tampa Stadium for the first time. Two seconds, one second, and this game is over. And Tampa Bay, an ecstatic crowd of better than 65,000, comes onto the field. The Big Sombrero was also known for the heat. Mixed tons of concrete, aluminum benches, zero cover, and Florida's infamous heat and humidity, and you get some pretty miserable conditions. Two Super Bowls, though, were played there along the way, 18 and 25. When Malcolm Glazer bought the team in 1995, he wasn't satisfied with Tampa Stadium, so up went Raymond James Stadium, where they started playing in 1998. Bucks are gonna win today. Bucks are gonna win today. Play fake, and Dilfer has a wide open, tight oh, great catch. catch by Dave Moore, and he's gonna dive in for the touchdown. The Ray J, named after Raymond James Financial, is one of the most unique stadiums in the NFL. Not only do fans dress up like pirates, but the stadium centerpiece is a massive pirate ship, complete with cannons. The Bucks haven't made a Super Bowl there yet, but it's hosted two and is scheduled to host a third in the coming years. Our final button on the old sombrero, it was torn down in 1998, a year after the Bucks took off. But it still plays a role in Tampa's home games, being it serves as Raymond James parking lot. Doesn't look like much of a hat anymore though. After 13 years of silent Sundays, Baltimore celebrated the return of the NFL and the birth of the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore Ravens, you likely know their story, owner Art Modell taking off from Cleveland after the 1995 season. His new franchise playing its home games at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore in 1996. Hi everybody and welcome to Memorial Stadium, a historic afternoon here in Baltimore as the old girl is back in town. Memorial Stadium had already housed the Colts in previous years, the Ravens playing there for just two seasons. Modell wanted something more modern and got his wish in 1998 when the team began play at Ravens Stadium. Hi everybody and welcome to Camden Yard. First known as Ravens Stadium at Camden Yards, it's since gone by PSI Net, back to Ravens Stadium, and now M&T Bank Stadium. Unofficially, you'll also hear it called the Big Crab Cake, or sometimes the Vault, by fans. Outside, you should check out the former facade of Memorial Stadium, which still pays tribute to those who have served our country. There's also the Walk, a first-of-its-kind tailgate area set up for fans who don't have parking for games. From there, you walk down to the stadium, and on the way in, it's tradition to stop by Unitas Plaza to rub the feet of the John Unitas statue for good luck. You can also choose to rub Ray Lewis's cleats for good measure. We are now to one of the two teams to only have played in one spot so far in their existence, 
the Jaguars joining the NFL in 1995 and playing all their home games at TIAA Bank Field. Go Jaguars! First fan cam on history to play here in Jacksonville, Municipal Stadium. Been 16 years waiting for this day. We're ready for them to play. We're ready to kick the crap out of Houston Oilers out there. The Jaguars lost their opener to the Oilers at what was then called Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. It was the first time an expansion team in the NFL played its very first game at a new facility. The name of the stadium has gone by Altel, Everbank, and then more recently to TIAA. Who wants Jackson to do a front kick? The Jags mascot, Jackson DeVille, traditionally bungee jumps his way onto the field prior to starting games. And then there's the swimming pools. 91 degrees feels like more in the high 90s. Do they have a press pool, do you know? Is that an option? <laughs> Uh, I did bring my suit. Oh, well. That's right. It's the only NFL stadium that comes fully equipped with its own pools. They were added as part of renovations that were completed prior to the 2014 season. And lastly, you have to know what Duval means. It's not only that a celebrity or former player kicks off every game by yelling it, it's what Jags fans yell all day long at their home field. Duval is the name of the county Jacksonville is located in, just in case you didn't know. <sighs> Same year the Jags hit the scene, the Panthers did as well, but their new stadium wasn't ready right out of the gate, so they had to spend a year at Clemson Stadium. The Carolina Panthers inaugural home game here in Clemson, South Carolina. Commissioner Paul Tagliabue handled the coin toss. The Panthers had to borrow the Tigers' den because a construction deadline for their permanent home wasn't met. But their renting days were over one season later. Erickson Stadium, as it was first known, was ready for business. Beautiful, beautiful stadium. They gonna rock in here. It's a rock and joint right here. It's beautiful, it's state of the art. It's the envy of the NFL. It was originally called Carolina's Stadium, but by the time the team started play there, it had been bought out by L.M. Erickson, and now goes by Bank of America Stadium, or BOA. The exterior of the stadium is characterized by three sets of huge arches, which frame the main entrances, which include these huge light domes and massive panther statues. The team says the statues, named Indomitable Spirit, are the largest bronze sculptures ever commissioned in the U.S. Inside, games usually are preceded by someone, a celeb type or former player, pounding on a huge drum, which leads to fans chanting, keep pounding, the team's motto. Our final stop takes us back to Texas, the Texans, the last team to join the NFL and the only other team besides Jacksonville to call one spot home, NRG Stadium. They have waited for this moment since 1996 for their team to take the field. NRG was originally called Reliance Stadium. It was the very first NFL stadium with a retractable roof, which takes about seven minutes to open or close. They have a section in the stands called the bullpen, which is made up of the most die-hard Texans fans. They try and get everyone going with back and forth chants of Houston, Texans, as well as shouting out the players' last names when they're introduced. They love their music in NRG too. The list of songs that play throughout games is too long to cover, but God Bless Texas and Deep in the Heart of Texas are staples on their playlist. NRG has two Super Bowls under its belt, both Patriots wins. They beat Carolina there in Super Bowl 38. Looks good! And then came back against the Falcons for that OT win in Super Bowl 51. But there you have it. In total, 186 stadiums have been home to an NFL team in its first 100 years in existence, and now, one year into its 101st season, they're already at 188. And do us a favor. Make this the ultimate stadiums fan forum. Share your favorite stadium experiences and memories in the comments section, because after all, they wouldn't exist without you. Happy stadiums, everyone.